Well, hello and uh, welcome back. So, in this particular lecture, I want to talk about fluid, electrolyte, and acid base homeostasis. And I believe as we go through this lecture, many of the things are going to seem familiar to you because it's things we've already talked about. So, this kind of uh, is, this chapter in the book, it kind of wraps up everything that we've talked about in regards to movement of water. Um, you know, where electrolytes are and how they're established in terms, terms of their homeostasis, and then how we establish acid-base um, balance. Alright, so I want to talk about the fluid compartments and fluid homeostasis first, and then we'll get into the other topics uh, a little bit later on. So, in adults, body fluids make up between 55 and 65% of the total mass of a human body. So, where a lot of fluids are inside of us. Um, there are two main compartments that we find uh, body fluids in, and that would be inside cells. So about two-thirds of your water is found inside of your cells. And uh, 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 outside of cells, about a third of your, of your water is found uh, outside the cells. So um, the water that's inside of our cells is called intracellular fluid, and we use the little abbreviation ICF. So intracellular fluid, and this is basically cytosol, the fluid part of your cells. Extracellular fluid is known as ECF, extracellular fluid, and it, is, it comprises uh, interstitial fluid. This is the fluid that bathes all the tissues of the body. That makes up about 80% of the uh, extracellular fluid. And then the plasma of your blood, the liquid part of your blood, makes up 20% of the extracellular fluid. Just to kind of graphically look at this, we have uh, here uh, a lean female and a lean male. And uh, you can see that females and males differ a little bit in the amount of fluids that they have in solids. So females 45% solids, 55% fluids. Males 40% solids, 60% fluids. And if we look at a, an average adult lean uh, male, uh, this is... Uh, this is what the extracellular fluid looks like. So two thirds of that 60% of fluids is uh, inter uh, intracellular fluid, um, and then of course one third is extracellular fluid. 80% is interstitial fluid. 20% plasma. So this just gives us a pictorial um, view of what I just talked about in a previous slide uh, about where fluids are and and how much of the body is made of those. So, you know, inside the body we have a lot of boundaries, and one of the great boundaries is the plasma membrane. Um, and uh, this plasma membrane is, separates the intracellular fluid from the interstitial fluid. So, if we kind of look at the little graphic down here, the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, is helping to create a boundary. So, you have a cell and you have interstitial fluid, so a separation of those, of those, um, those uh, compartments. So blood vessel walls, so if we look at the graphic down here, the blood vessel wall, which is made of a simple squamous epithelium, this divides the interstitial fluid from the blood plasma. So inside the capillary we'll have blood plasma. Here we have interstitial fluid. The blue substance is interstitial fluid. And then the yellow substance is intracellular fluid. So we have various compartments inside of the human body that, that hold different kinds of fluids, different compositions of fluids. And, uh, and uh, so we have a lot of boundaries uh, and compartments that are made up inside the body. Now you know that uh, the capillary walls are thin enough to allow the exchange of water and solutes between the blood plasma and inter interstitial fluid. And the plasma membrane, depending upon the cell, is going to allow fluids to move into and out and electrolytes to move into and out of it as well. So even though these cells create boundaries, uh, and we have different compartments, there is an exchange of fluids between these uh, various compartments within the human body. So some of the processes that move fluids, uh, things that we've already talked about before, would include things like filtration. Let me get my highlighter right here. So we have filtration, um, we have reabsorption, Okay, filtration is where you squeeze uh, the, the plasma out of the capillaries and the kidneys. Reabsorption is where you bring water back into the blood vessels. We have the movement of fluids and electrolytes, diffusion and osmosis. Okay, so osmosis is the movement of water. Diffusion is the movement of, 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 
ions and, and things of that nature through the membranes of the cells. So there is a continuous exchange of water and solutes among body fluid compartments. So the balance of inorganic compounds that disassociate into ions is closely related to fluid balance. So we do have uh, ions um, that come from electrolytes. Electrolytes will break down to form ions. You are familiar with sodium, potassium, calcium, and some of those ions like that. So the balance that's established is going to be related to fluid balance. And what we say by that is that typically, you know, wherever the solutes go, the water follows, or wherever salt goes, water follows. So um, the balance of all these things is very closely related to fluid balance, as we'll see a little bit later too. So body gains water by ingestion. So we can bring water in, and of course, we actually generate metabolic water in the process of aerobic respiration. If you have ever studied aerobic respiration, you will remember that in aerobic respiration, we use oxygen to pick up electrons from the food that we've broken down, and we use uh, some hydrogen ions to make water at the very end of aerobic respiration. So, um, so by eating, uh, eating and drinking, well, by drinking and eating food, we can get water, and then we can generate a little bit of it by making energy. And as you're familiar with, water loss is going to be done via urination, perspiration, so sweating, um, exhalation, so just every time you give a breath off, you have water that goes out, and then uh, in the fecal matter, there will be uh, some water as well. So just looking at this graphically, we can see over here a cell. Over here we have extracellular fluid. Inside the cell we have the intracellular fluid. And uh, just to kind of look at this, we have water. So the things that are influencing extracellular fluid, we have water being absorbed across the digestive epithelium. That can be water from what you drink and the food that we eat. So, and these numbers are just kind of, you know, just you, if you look at a different textbook, you'll see a different number. But here in this graphic, 2,200 milliliters of water come in um, daily through the water we absorb and the, and the food that we eat. We have metabolic water, about 300 milliliters in this graphic, coming into extracellular fluid. So we do lose uh, water. We lose water through, um, the, uh, through the skin and lungs. Uh, we lose water through feces, and uh, of course we sweat, and that can be a variable kind of amount of water that we lose. So, and then of course urine is going to um, take out water as well. And if you begin to add everything up, typically the amount of water that comes in each day equals the amount of water that goes out each day. Um, and that's a, that's a balance that you have to maintain. If too much water leaves, you get dehydrated. If too much water comes in, it causes water toxicity. And of course, you will have an exchange of intracellular fluids and extracellular fluids to help maintain that balance as well. Again, don't get too locked down on these numbers, but this is just water gains and water loss, just kind of showing you graphically. If you notice, the numbers are different than the previous graphic because I got these sources from different uh, different uh, places. So remember that you have an input daily of food that uh, we eat, which has lots of water in it. Uh, we consume water, and we have metabolic water. And, of course, we urinate, expire, um, you know, through our lungs, uh, evaporate uh, water through our skin, and lose water through our feces. You want to try to, you know, balance that out. So what comes in goes out, same amount. So your level of aerobic respiration, that process where you're generating ATP using your mitochondria, that's going to determine the volume of metabolic water. Um, the amount of water formed is directly por proportional to the amount of ATP produced. So if you produce more ATP, more water will be made. If you produce less ATP, less water will be made. So you know, I mean, it's intuitive that when water loss is greater than water gain, you get this thing called dehydration. Okay, Dehydration is a very complex behavior that leads to, to various kinds of... Dehydration is a very complex um, physiological um, process that leads eventually to increased thirst and, and many other little mechanisms that will help you to bring more water back into the body. 
So elimination of excess body water occurs through urine production mainly. And the amount of urinary salt lost is the main factor in determining body fluid um, volume. So it's always important that you know or remember that water always follows salt. So if you have a lot of salt in your urine, a lot of water is going to follow it. And if you reabsorb a lot of salt, a lot of water will come back out of, um, you know, out of the kidney tubule back into the plasma of your blood. The two main solutes in urine are going to be sodium and chloride ions, which is salt. And wherever solutes go, water is going to follow. So the kidneys use where these solutes are located to help reabsorb water or, or put more water into, um, into the collecting ducts to be made into urine. So there are a lot of hormones uh, controlling water balance, and you can probably understand why there would be a lot of control mechanisms. You know, without water, your cells, you know, are going to be dehydrated. They won't work. With too much water, they swell up and, and get damaged. So we have to control water all the time. We use hormones to do that. So one of the major hormones we've talked about before is an antidiuretic hormone. This is a posterior pituitary hormone. It uh, promotes water retention by the kidneys. It tells the collecting ducts of the kidneys to reabsorb more water. And this is a very powerful hormone that you are secreting every, every day to maintain homeostasis. We also have the renin-angiotensin system. This is a system that forms an active hormone called angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is going to stimulate a behavior called thirst. It's going to stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone. It also will stimulate the release of aldosterone, uh, which is another uh, major hormone that's going to regulate, uh, help regulate water balance. Uh, if you remember, um, angiotensin um, uh, is going to be released from the kidneys. So the kidneys are going to uh, release a hormone called renin, which is going to convert an, a, a circulating hormone, uh, angiotensin, angiotensinogen, to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by uh, enzymes in the lungs. So you may want to go back and refer to the, the, the kidney uh, lecture and, and go back over that system um, there's a beautiful graphic in that in that uh, that PowerPoint that you could see. Aldosterone, if you remember, is made by the adrenal gland. It's made in the zona glomerulosa and of the adrenal cortex, and this hormone increases the reabsorption of sodium by the kidneys. Now remember, sodium water always follows sodium, so if you reabsorb more sodium, more water will come back into the body. So there is a hormone made by the heart muscle tissue called atrial natri natriuretic peptide, or ANP, and this hormone is going to be stimulated to promote the loss of water and the loss of sodium by the kidneys. It stimulates the loss of sodium, water follows the sodium, and, and produces more urine. So, um, so that happens with, uh, with your heart muscle. So again, some of these are going to cause more water to be reabsorbed. Some of these are going to be causing water to be lost. Now dehydration is going to do uh, very complex things within the body. Uh, one thing, it's going to decrease the flow of saliva, which causes a dry mouth, which will stimulate the thirst um, center in the hypothalamus. Uh, dehydration is going to decrease blood osmolarity. That is the amount of dissolved solutes inside of it. It's going to, excuse me, increase uh, the blood osmolarity, which means it's going to, um, it's going to increase the number of solutes in the plasma of the blood. This stimulates osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus uh, to stimulate thirst. I mean, there's some other complex things too, like release of antidiuretic hormone is stimulated by uh, high osmolarity of the blood. And then a decrease in blood volume is going to de is going to cause a decrease in blood pressure. Blood volume is is uh, related to the amount of pressure you have in your blood vessels. The more blood volume, higher pressure, lower blood volume, lower blood pressure. So this decrease in blood pressure is going to be sensed by the kidneys, and that's going to increase the production of the renin, and therefore increase the production of angiotensin II eventually, and uh, that will stimulate thirst as well. Of course, increased thirst will increase your water intake and will help to relieve dehydration or increase the blood volume, decrease the blood osmolarity, and um, 
and allow more saliva to be produced. Now, if you have a high intake of sodium chloride, that will increase the plasma concentrations of sodium and chloride. This increases the osmosis of water from the intracellular fluid to the interstitial fluid, which eventually goes to the plasma, which increases your blood volume. So if you, have, uh, if you eat a really salty diet, you can only assume that it's going to increase your blood volume. That increase in blood volume, uh, it, you know, it can't stay forever. You're going to have to maintain homeostasis. So a couple things happen. You get a, uh, a stretching of the atria of the heart. So you get a release of ANP. That's going to reduce the reabsorption of sodium chloride by the kidneys. So it's going to cause more salt to be in the, in the tubules, therefore cause more water to flow over. That increases the loss of sodium chloride in the urine, which increases the loss of water in the urine, which increases, which, excuse me, decreases your blood volume. Now on the flip side, that increase in blood volume is going to uh, decrease the release of renin by the kidneys which is going to decrease the formation of angiotensin II, which is going to decrease aldosterone. Okay, It will also increase the, the filtration rate at the glomerulus. And all of those things are going to um, reduce reabsorption of sodium chloride, and therefore eventually they're going to cause water uh, loss and uh, a decrease in blood volume. Okay, so that's what happens when you eat a high salty diet. People that eat a high salty diet are going to have higher blood pressure because it increases blood volume, causes higher blood pressure. Now, just about everything we eat has salt in it because salt is a preservative. So that's something you got to be real careful of when you eat lots of canned foods and, and, uh, and uh, processed foods is you have to watch the salt content. And this is just a little graphic just showing you, uh, you know, the factor, the mechanism, and the effect to maintain um, homeostasis. So you could pause the video and look at that. It's just a review of what we just uh, talked about. Now, one thing that people don't realize is that you can actually kill yourself drinking too much water. It's called water intoxication. Well, eventually it leads to water toxicity and, uh, and death. And uh, this occurs when uh, excess body water causes swells, uh, cells to swell up uh, to, to danger, dangerous sizes. Um, this can occur when a person consumes too much more water. Um, pardon me. This will occur when, uh, when a person, let's see if I can go back here. Let me get back to my graphic there. I don't know what's the deal there. So this water intoxication can occur uh, from several different things, uh, mainly from drinking too much water, so uh, faster than the kidneys can excrete it. So if you follow the little flow chart over here, if you have if you have excessive blood loss, let me get my pen back. So there's a couple things that can cause this. If you have excessive blood loss, um excessive sweating, uh, lots of vomiting or diarrhea, coupled with a large intake of just plain water, this can decrease the sodium concentration of the interstitial fluid in the plasma. It causes a condition called uh, hyponatremia, which means low sodium content. This low sodium content causes a decrease in the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid in the plasma of your blood. And remember, if you, if you have uh, low osmolarity, um, we're going to have osmosis of water from the interstitial fluid into the intracellular fluid. So water moves from an area of low solute to an area of high solute. So if you have a decreased osmolarity of the interstitial fluid, that means there's more solute inside of the cells of your body. So water moves from an area of low solute to an area of high solute. So the osmosis of water is going to go from the interstitial fluid to the intracellular fluid. So water is basically going out of your plasma, out of your interstitial fluid. It's going into the cells of your body. And those cells are going to swell. And that swelling, especially within the nervous system tissue, 
the swelling of the cells is, is going to lead to irregular electrical activity, convulsions, um, um, a coma, and then uh, eventually death if, um, if homeostasis is not reestablished. Okay, so be real careful of water intoxication. You usually see water intoxication in people that are oftentimes dieting, but they're exercising a lot, drinking lots and lots and lots of water. So they're sweating a lot, but drinking lots of water. So they're losing a lot of salt, but they're drinking a lot of plain water. So this is a, a, a pretty big issue. Okay, so electrolyte balance is what we want to go ahead and cover next. That was just fluid balance that we talked about previously. So electrolyte balance is, uh, is really super important too. And uh, just by definition, an electrolyte is a substance that disassociates into, ion, disassociates into ions when it's in an aqueous or water solution. And uh, when these ions are disassociated, they acquire the capacity to collect, uh, conduct electrical uh, activity or electricity. Common electrolytes that you may associate with would be like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, chloride, and bicarbonate. These are super, super important electrolytes. And if you ever look at uh, like Gatorade bottle, a Gatorade bottle, um, they're going to have many of these materials in that, uh, in that fluid. So ions form when electrolytes disassociate and dissolve. And these, in, in these, uh, these ions um, that are forming are going to be very important in doing things like controlling osmosis of water between, between fluid compartments. I, I told you previously that sodium chloride, you know, water always follows those ions. So it's going to help maintain acid-base balance. These ions that uh, form uh, from uh, electrolytes that disassociate, uh, they're going to carry electrical current. And they're going to serve as cofactors. These are little material uh, ions that stick to enzymes to help activate enzymes. The concentration of ions is expressed in units of milliequivalents per liter. So this is the, the units that we actually look at these things in. So uh, lowercase m, capital E, Q, lowercase q per liter. And if you ever look at a blood readout, uh, a chemistry uh, uh, readout of the blood, uh, you'll see milliequivalents per liter as, um, as ways that you can tell how many ions are in the, uh, in the blood. So blood plasma, interstitial fluid, and intracellular fluid um, have different concentrations of these electrolytes. And it's, uh, it's really important uh, that, we, that we realize that. Um, you know, we've talked about muscle and nerves in previous lectures and how they conduct um, electrical impulses. You know, they use sodium and potassium um, to, to, in order to change their charge. So these electrolytes are really super important in, in, um, in being concentrated in, in unequal amounts in different parts of either the fluids of the body or, or, or inside of cells. So um, there's also uh, protein ions, too, that... Uh, that are uh, differently concentrated within different fluid compartments of the body. So blood plasma contains many protein ions. Interstitial fluid only contains a few of them. So one reason why water doesn't just all leave your plasma of your blood is because of these protein ions helping to mainstay, ma maintain osmotic balance. This is a pretty important chart. I mean, if you ever go into the healthcare field, um, you know, there are certain things that you test for during certain disease states. Um, to see if uh, concentrations are high or low. For example, I'll just give you an example. You want to have a really high concentration of intercellular, in intercellular fluid of potassium. If you see a lot of potassium in the blood plasma, that indicates that cells are probably being destroyed somewhere and opening up, thus releasing the potassium inside of themselves and increasing the amount that's in the blood plasma and in the interstitial fluid. So this helps doctors real quickly determine, you know, if there's like massive damage, in, internal damage or damage in muscles by looking at the concentrations of these ions and, and uh, they know the normal and the abnormal amounts that should be in the, in the fluids of the body. So if you just look at sodium, sodium is very uh, low in the interstitial fluid, but it's very high in the, um, in the extracellular fluid, in your, in your plasma and interstitial fluids. Um, so that's a good thing that sodium's high on the outside, low on the inside. 
So remember, nerves and muscles don't work unless sodium flows in. So if you had a high sodium content inside your cell, it probably wouldn't flow in. Thus, you wouldn't be able to send electrical impulses. So potassium, very high on the inside, very low on the outside. Remember that sodium-potassium pump? That sodium-potassium pump is going to help maintain, in addition to sodium leak channels and potassium leak channels, that's going to help maintain the uh, intracellular and, and extracellular concentration of those particular materials. Calcium, kind of low on both the, the um, intracellular and extracellular side, but it's lower on the intracellular and the inter intracellular fluid than extracellular fluid. Magnesium, higher in intracellular fluid than extracellular fluid. Chloride, very high on the outside, very low on the inside of cells. Um, you know, bicarbonate, uh, kind of uh, a little bit lower on the intracellular, intracellular side, a little higher on the extracellular side. Um, so this uh, monohydrogen phosphate uh, is, is going to be part of a buffering system inside of cells. You can see it's really commonly used in intracellular fluid, but not so much on extracellular fluid. Here we have sulfate, higher on the inside than outside of cells, and protein ions. We have a lot of proteins inside cells, a lot of proteins in the plasma of the blood, but very little in the interstitial fluid. Again, you know, when you go into, uh, you know, your, your training for being a nurse or physician's assistant or a doctor, you're going to spend a lot of time learning and memorizing the, uh, the values, how many milliequivalents are, are supposed to be found, especially in plasma of the blood, so that you can diagnose very quickly an injury or a disease that a person has. I want to go through and talk about each of these uh, just briefly, these ions. Uh, and let's talk about sodium. This is the most abundant cation that's a positively charged ion in the extracellular fluid. It's used for impulse transmission, muscle contraction, fluid balance. Sodium is more abundant in the extracellular fluid than in the intracellular fluid. And uh, as we talked about previously, its level is controlled by aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and uh, ANP. So hyponatremia is low sodium concentration of extracellular fluid, and uh, hypernatremia is high sodium concentration of extracellular fluid. So remember that sodium, salt always, uh, water always follows salt. So the concentration of those in the plasma of the blood is really important at the movement and in, in, in interstitial fluid at the movement of because it's causing the movements of fluids. So if we have an increase in sodium level, that means that we're going to have osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus that are going to be stimulated. That has a lot of things that it does. One thing is to promotion of thirst. Antidiuretic hormone will be released um, and it's going to have its action on the kidney. The kidney is going to cause the water to be reabsorbed back into the body. Thirst is going to promote the consumption of water. And then all of these complex events is going to lead to restoration of the sodium level or a decrease in sodium level. If we have a decrease in sodium level, that's going to cause osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus to be inhibited, which decreases antidiuretic hormone, which causes the kidney to increase the loss of water. Thirst is suppressed, and that will, that will eventually lead to... Um, levels of sodium in the extracellular fluid eventually getting back to homeostasis. Now the amount of sodium is, is definitely tied to the amount of, of um, the volume of water in the plasma of the blood. So if we have increasing extracellular volume or fluid or, uh, or sodium gain thus causing more water to stay in that's going to cause a rise in blood pressure that's going to be sensed by the cardiac muscle tissue. They'll release ANP. ANP is going to have uh, go to the hypothalamus, the kidneys, and the blood vessels to cause an increased sodium loss in the urine, an increased water loss with that sodium because the water follows the sodium, decrease in thirst, inhibition of things like antidiuretic hormone, aldosterone, um, and then uh, vasodilation. So this will restore your extracellular fluid volume and also the, 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 the reestablish the homeostasis of sodium. On the flip side of that, if we have a decrease in extracellular 
fluid volume by fluid loss or loss of sodium, there's some complex things that occur. You have baroreceptors throughout your body that activate the sympathetic nervous system, which will activate the hypothalamus in the heart to increase antidiuretic hormone and to increase um, vasoconstriction. So you'll get an increase in blood pressure, increase in thirst. So you'll also activate the kidneys to increase its production of renin, which will activate eventually or make eventually angiotensin II. Angiotensin II will cause uh, aldosterone release, which will decrease sodium loss, decrease water loss in the urine, which will increase or restore our blood volume or sodium level. Sodium is really important to know. I spent pretty much time, a lot of time talking about it today, so make sure you really go back and look at that and think about um, the importance of sodium. Potassium is the most important cation, in, so cation, positive charged ion, in the intracellular fluid. It's involved in fluid volume, impulse conduction, and muscle contraction and regulating pH. So the hormone uh, aldosterone regulates the plasma level of potassium. So we do have the hormone aldosterone working on this. Aldosterone conserves sodium, but it causes potassium to be excreted. Hypokalemia is a deficiency of potassium. Hypo, hyperkalemia is an elevated level of potassium. And when I see, if I were a doctor and I saw hyperkalemia after a person was, was bitten by a venomous snake, I'm thinking, wow, this person's lost a lot of blood cells. A lot of blood cells are being destroyed by that venom, and it's releasing all the potassium into the bloodstream. And that could be very fatal, potentially fatal for my, uh, for my patient. So calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. It's a structural component of bones and teeth. It's used for blood, blood coagulation neurotransmitter release and muscle contraction. Um, levels in the plasma are regulated by parathyroid hormone, PTH, and uh, that will increase bone resorption, that is um, the taking of calcium out of the bone and putting it into the bloodstream. Calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D, promotes calcium absor absorption by the intestinal cells Calcitonin promotes the calcium deposition or depositing in bones. So we have parathyroid hormone, calcitriol, and calcitonin. Magnesium, 60% of it's found in the bone, 40% is found in intracellular fluid. Um, this is an important ion because it activates enzymes involved in carbohydrate and protein metabolism. And of course, it's uh, important in the sodium potassium pump. It's used in myocardial um, function, so your heart, work, making your heart work, synaptic transmission, that is um, communicating between nerves and nerves, and uh, it's also involved in the sodium potassium pump, as I indicated previously, right here. Phosphate is required for uh, bone and, and tooth mineralization. Calcium phosphate salts make up the hard material found in bones and teeth. It's used in buffering body fluids. Dihydrogen phosphate is, uh, is a very important uh, buffering uh, material, as we'll see when we talk about acid-base balance in a, in a little bit. It's required for the formation of ATP, nucleic acids. And its regulation is done by parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone increases bone resorption and release of phosphate into the bloodstream. It causes the kidneys, though, to sec uh, secrete uh, phosphate into urine, thus lowering phosphate levels in the blood. Calcitriol promotes the, um, the active uh, absorption of uh, phosphate by intestinal cells. Chloride is the most uh, abundant anion, that's the negatively, negatively charged ion, in extracellular fluid. It helps to regulate osmotic pressure between compartments. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've talked about in the past is the chloride shift um, in red blood cells. That chloride shift takes in chloride uh, it, 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 in exchange, it actually takes out chloride in exchange, excuse me, it takes out um, um, chloride in exchange for bicarbonate 
It takes bicarbonate out of the red blood cell in exchange for chloride to help maintain uh, an established balance of the red blood cell. Um, chloride is a pretty important too because it helps you to form hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So bicarbonate is the second most prevalent extracellular fluid anion. It's a major member of the blood, uh, blood plasma and uh, uh, it's a major member of the blood plasma acid base uh, buffering system as you'll see when we do that in just a little bit. The kidneys re, uh, reabsorb or secrete it for final acid base balance of urine. And there's charts that you can look at in various texts that can give you things like, uh, like uh, deficiencies and excessive amounts of each of the electrolytes. So you could pause the video and kind of look and review that if you'd like. And you could pause here and look at that if you'd like as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop here and uh, that'll be our first chunk and uh, I'll just do acid-base balance on a separate uh, smaller video. So until I see you next time, I hope that you have uh, um, you know, good luck in your studying and reviewing of these materials. Remember, you can always go back and review anything by just hitting the rewind button and looking back through things. So until next time, I will see you later.